If you have your New Testament tonight, if you would, turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans, the third chapter, and for the time being, verse number 1. Romans 3 and verse 1. Paul writing says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Once again, a pleasant good evening to you. Always glad to be back at what seems to be our home away from home here at Rock Cliff. I was honored with the invitation to come speak, as always, anywhere I get the chance to go preach God's message. But when your father-in-law says, hey, can you fill in for me tonight? It kind of elevates itself on the list just a little bit. And I'll tell you, out of preaching for 15 years, this may be the first time that I have filled in and the preacher that was leaving said, here's what you need to preach, and here are the questions that you need to answer. So, But Bill knew that in Arlington, I'm also preaching through uh, Bible Bowl with Romans, so it was just a natural fit. So with that, let's look at the book of Romans. And I am proud of our kids today. See, I can say our kids because we're one big team. I suggested calling it Arliff or Rocklington, but apparently that did not go over like I, I knew it wouldn't go over well. I'm just glad that, you know, Christian unity, it's great when we can team up for the greater cause. As we look at Romans chapter 3, I've titled this, this chapter, A Worldwide Dilemma. As you look at the book of Romans, you'll see that chapter 1, Paul sets out with his thesis statement uh, that uh, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. After we get through that, he then depicts the Gentile world and how wicked they were. It ends the chapter with about 20 different sins that they were involved in. And as this letter was probably being read in the churches of Rome, the Jewish members were just sitting back. Oh, they were so happy. And then chapter 2 spends a whole chapter answering the question, what about the Jews? Because the Jews were just as bad as the Gentiles, but Paul wanted to address one than the other. Just a little background info. Paul, when you see an R in my notes, that's a capital R, that's Rome, because I get tired of typing things. So we see that Paul has not been to Rome when he writes to the church at Rome. You know, Paul spent about three years in Ephesus. So when he writes the Ephesian letter, it's very personal. Paul spent time in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. He spent time in Thessalonica in chapter 17 of Acts. Chapter 18 is Corinth. Chapter 19 is, is Ephesus. And he was all throughout the Galatian regions. When he writes these epistles, they're very personal. But he hasn't been to Rome yet when he writes this one. So it's, it's still a personal letter, but it's not as personal maybe as some of his other ones were. There's a spot in Acts chapter 20, verses 2 through 3, where he waits out a season, if you will, about three months in the winter. And it's thought that's probably when Paul actually sat down to write this Roman letter. May have written Corinthians while he was there as well. At the end of the book of Acts, it ends with Paul making it to Rome which was the goal for a long time, to go preach the gospel to Rome. And I tell you what, the best way to go somewhere is if someone else pays for the ticket. And so the Roman authority paid for Paul. He had to make his case before Caesar. Uh, but the Roman government paid for Paul to go to Rome, and he preached at every step of the way. Now, although we live in 2022, we don't really think about this, but the church in Rome was a mixed church, if you will. It had a good number of Jewish Christians and a good number of Gentile Christians or Greeks, if you will. So at times, there would be a clash of culture because the Jewish people grew up one way and the Gentile people grew up another way. And although they're now one in Christ, your background comes into play. So they would butt heads from time to time, and that's what Paul is writing part of Romans to address. So as we mentioned, Paul shifts his attention in chapter 1. Uh, the pronouns he uses are they and them. Chapter 2, he says we or you, talking uh, shifts there. In chapter 3, he's going to answer the objections that the Jewish people have. We're going to cover, Lord willing, in our time tonight, the first 20 verses, and I believe next week Brother Bill's going to pick up and finish the chapter. So let's look 
look at the first 20 verses of Romans chapter 3. And really, uh, two divisions in here. You've got verses 1 through 8, and then verses 9 through 20. So I want us to read these first eight verses, and then we'll back up and comment and work on our questions as well. Paul says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. Thou mayest overcome when thou art judged. But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who maketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the world hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil, that good may come, whose damnation is just." you got to think about this. As Paul has written this, it may have been delivered by Phoebe, I don't know, but this letter was not delivered by Paul. It was written and sent. And so as Paul is writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, after he's listed the, pr the premise of the book, the gospel is the power of salvation, after he has identified that sins that both the Gentiles and then the Jewish people are doing, naturally his audience reading this for the first time is going to have questions. And so Paul is writing to answer those questions before they arise. Of course, Paul writing by the Holy Spirit, of course, so he knew what would happen. There's really three objections. I'll show you where a fourth one could be, but it's not often regarded as such. Three objections, and they're labeled A, B, and C in my notes. So the first objection, what about the covenant? Here to answer question one in our notes, uh, they had the oracles of God. Notice this objection here. What about God's covenant? Well, in verse 1, he asked, What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Now, he's just talked about circumcision at the end of chapter 2, and he's talked about it both in a physical sense, the cutting off of the flesh, and the spiritual sense, the cutting off of sin. So then he naturally goes and says, Well, then what advantage is there of circumcision? Because for the Jewish people, that was one of the things that they thought made them different, made them set apart. So in essence, in verse 1, he's saying, well, if you, what you say is true, what is the point of being a Jew? Now, of course, we know today, Jew and Gentile, one and the same in the gospel, it doesn't matter because Jesus died for all of us. But they were still relatively new to this idea, being about 30 years, if that, removed from Jesus' death on the cross. So that was still a new idea for some of these fine brothers and sisters that we have. So, if you say, what about God's covenant? The answer, verse 2, what is the prophet? Very much. Chiefly, they have the oracles of God. But I want you to note here, dear friends, that an advantage alone does not equal a guaranteed success. Just because you have an advantage doesn't mean that you're going to come out successful. Although I am not the world's biggest sports fan, I do like to watch and read stories about games from time to time, and you'll see teams, and, and it seems like they've got the winning hand and everything goes for them. They have the advantage going into the playoffs, and then what do they do? They blow it sometimes, don't they? Just because you have an advantage doesn't mean you're going to be successful. You've got to use the cards or the skills or the abilities that you have. So just because the Jews, they had God's Word. The whole Old Testament is geared for the Jewish mindset, looking forward to the time when the Gentiles could come in. So they had God's Word, but if you don't put it into practice, dear friends, it does you nothing. For us today, if we may have the nicest copy of Scripture that's ever been printed, maybe of you know calfskin leather and bonded and sewn just right and have three or four ribbon markers, it may be the nicest copy of Scripture, but if you never read it and open it, it does you absolutely no good. I'd rather have a beat-up Bible that I've read than one that I haven't. Advantage alone is not enough. What about our second objection here? Well, verse number 3, For what if some do not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? He's asking, in essence, 
What about this? Does this nullify God's faithfulness? Because God's been faithful. I can turn to any page in Scripture and I can show you, either expressly or implied, how God has been faithful to His people. So what about this then? What about the Jews? Since they didn't believe, does that make God's faithfulness of no effect? No, in essence, he's almost just having a play on words there in verse 3. What if they did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God of no effect? Talking about unbelief, but then kind of believing in him in a way, but not acting upon that. Well, I want you to notice the rebuttal here in verse 4. God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, Thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and might overcome when thou art judged. So what's the rebuttal? No. Just because people were unfaithful doesn't make God unfaithful. God has been faithful from the very beginning. When He said something was going to happen, it happened. Now, if the people were faithful or not, God still said destruction would come upon them, salvation, whatever the case may be in the Old Testament. So just because the audience was unfaithful doesn't make God unfaithful. But I want you to notice this phrase here, and you're going to see it a lot as you study through the book of Romans, those two little words starting out in verse number 4, God forbid. That's what King James says. Other translations will render it as certainly not. I've also seen it translated as heaven's no. God forbid is the strongest way in the Greek language, which is what Paul was writing in, that he could have said no. God forbid was the strongest negative phrase in the Greek language. So as this letter is being written, and then as this letter is being read to the church there in Rome, as they're reading through this, and the, and the answer is God forbid, in my mind, a lot of the people in there that knew Greek, they just kind of sat back a little bit. That was the strongest way of saying no. I also think it may have been one of Paul's favorite phrases, ways to say no, because it's going to show up time and time again in the Roman letter. Now, something interesting I do want us to point out as well here from the fourth verse is he makes a statement. He says, as it is written. He's quoting from the book of Psalms. That would be Psalm 51, about verse number 4. He makes an Old Testament quotation, and he's going to make more of them. We're going to look at some of those here in a second. But see, this tells me the book of Psalms, as David writes Psalm 51, was written about 1,000 B.C. So about 1,000 years before Paul writes to the Romans, he viewed David's writings as Scripture. He viewed them as inspired because he quotes from them by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So, so far, he's answering their objections, this worldwide dilemma of sin. Well, what about the Jews? What profit is there of circumcision? What about people's unfaithfulness? Let's look at our third question in verse number 5. But if our unrighteousness command the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? So, we're talking about the vengeance of God... Is God's vengeance being underestimated? Is His vengeance being underestimated? Well, the answer is no. Once again, it's not because God is just in everything that He does. And dear friends, the moment that God quits being just in everything He does, He quits being God. Because everything about the very nature of God is just. And He is the epitome of what is righteous. So in verse 5, we see honestly how ridiculous human beings can be when they try to justify their own sins. You ever met somebody who's tried to justify their own sins? See, notice I didn't ask if you'd tried to justify your own sins, So I think we all have one time or another, have we not? But you'll meet somebody and maybe they've done an act they shouldn't have, and then they say, well, I know I really shouldn't have, but I was with so-and-so and they made me do that, or, or they influenced me to do that. Then you see them next time and that friend went with them and they did it again. You say, what happened? They said, well, I did it that first time because of them. See, they keep trying to cover up and cover up and cover up. Although he was not inspired, the late, great Will Rogers, who never met a man he didn't like, often was quoted as saying, if you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. <laughs> 
And I'm afraid too many times, even, and that happens a lot in the world, but even our good brothers and sisters in Christ, they'll dig themselves in a hole and then they'll keep digging. Just quit. It's okay to admit you're wrong and need somebody to throw some dirt in the hole so you can climb out of that pit that you're in. But too many times here, because they're trying to say, what about God's unrighteousness? What about God's righteousness? What about this? What about that? Quit worrying about the righteousness of God because God is righteous. You be righteous. Quit trying to justify your own sins. It will not work. And so once again, God forbid, how then shall God judge the world? How could God judge the world if He wasn't righteous? He's righteous. We know the psalmist says in Psalm 119, the sum, the total of all of thy words is truth. Therefore, it makes him the judge. Jesus says, John 12, 48, by my words, you will be judged. Which is a reassuring thought, is it not? I know what's going to be on that final test. I don't have to worry about should I do this to please God or not because he has told me. Now it's up to you and I to live according to that. Now we get to verses 7 and 8. Make sure I'm good on my questions. Uh, yes, so far we are. Okay. Seven and eight, some people have tried to find another objection. It's not really an objection. There's really just three. But they'll ask the question, verse seven and eight, for if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, some affirm that we say, let us do evil, that good may come, whose their damnation is just. So this objection, it says, are you not confused about God's glory? That's what some people will say. I tell you what, Paul's going to better answer this in chapter 6. He says, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He says, don't be confused about the glory of God. Don't be doing evil just to have God's blessings. Instead, do good, and then you can receive God's blessings. As I mentioned, this is not really an objection. But I want you to notice here in verse number 8, because evil is never good. Evil is never good. And sin is never to be commended. Now here's where uh, we get in hot water. Not we as those of us here, but we as mankind. Because we know something is a sin, but then too many times we'll have a family member who starts doing that. And then too many times people, it's like they lose their backbone and they grow a wishbone instead. And if they have a family member involved in this sin, well, it, it, maybe it's not as bad. No, dear friends, a sin is a sin. I don't care who's doing it. I don't care if it's you or a dear loved one or someone I've never met. If God said not to do it and you do it, that's a sin. We can't go out and say, well, it's okay because they're little. They don't know any better. Well, you can teach them better. Oh, well, they're older. They don't know any better. Yes, they do. As a society, and I'm almost afraid as a church, we're just kind of letting some things slip and saying, well, we just... It'd be easier if I didn't talk to them about it because then that makes me uncomfortable. No, here we see that evil is always evil. I don't care if the government tells you to do it or I don't care if your loved ones tell you to do it. Evil is always evil. That's what Paul says. That's what God says, not me. So we've answered some objections. Let's see, number five on our questions. The second question, I am judged as a man. All right, we're caught up now. Let's look here at our second. Oh, Paul thought this phrase needed no refutation. He doesn't really answer it. He just says it. Now we're going to look at how both the Jew and the Gentile are under sin. And both need God's righteousness. Let's just kind of go through this verse by verse, if you will. Verse number nine, what then? Are we better than they, we, Jew, they, Gentile? Paul was a Jew, was he not? In fact, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a, of a good stock even. So when he says we, he's talking about his Jewish brethren, and they are the Gentiles. He's not slanderously putting them down. That's just his nationality. Field. So are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have proved before both Jews and Gentiles, they are all under sin. There's number seven. They are all under 
under sin. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or if you're a Gentile. When he says before, he's previously indicted them through most of chapter 1, all of chapter 2, and then the first nine or eight verses of chapter number 3. He has proved how sin is truly a worldwide problem. Let's look at verses 10 through 12 together, if you will, as it is written. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, and are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. As it is written... Paul is using a technique in the Greek called a charaz or a charaz. You don't have to know that word to get into heaven, C-H-A-R-A-Z. But it's the idea of stringing pearls together. It's where that phrase comes from in Greek. It's almost as if you were to make a pearl necklace. Well, you don't just have one pearl on the pearl necklace, but you have a lot of them, don't you? And you drill a hole and you put one after another until the necklace is completed. Today in a sermon we call it using proof text. Paul is going to begin and really using the rest of our section with Old Testament Scripture that backs up what he has just said. Stringing together proof text, if this seems unfamiliar to you, it's basically what every sermon I've ever heard preached is in one way or another, is you have a thought. God is good. And then you have three or five points. You're stringing together these verses to prove a biblical teaching. So look here with me in Psalm 14 and verse verses 1 through 3. And you may want to just hold your place in Psalms. We've got a couple of those coming up. But Psalm number 14 and the first three verses. The fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. We see here, the Lord looketh down from heaven on the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Paul's made a statement. He's backing it up with what David has said. Let's go back to Romans. Hold your place there in Psalms. Verses 13 and 14. Now the quote. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of bitterness, of cursing and bitterness. Illustration on point here of proof text. You ready for this? Look in Psalm chapter 5 and verse number 9 because Paul is talking about different parts of their body. David says in Psalm 5 and verse number 9, There is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher, and they flatter with their tongue. Is that not what Paul had just said? They flatter with their tongue? Let's pick up that uh, chapter 10 and verse 7. We're going out of order on our presentation, but chapter Psalm 10 is next. Psalm 10 and verse number 7. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. His tongue is mischief and vanity will... Paul says that their mouth is full of these things. Go with me to Psalm 140, towards the back of the collection of 150 psalms. Psalm 140 and verse number 3. He says, David once again, They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent or an asp, either one. Adder's poison is under their lips, and that word of a pause of Selah. So what has Paul done? Talking about from their throat to their tongues to even the poison in their lips under their tongues. He's talking about people who live a sinful life, but he's using this and proving it through the Old Testament. We've got some more. Look at this, verses 15 through 17 of Romans 3. He says, Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. Go with me to the book of Isaiah, if you will. That wonderful prophet Isaiah and the 56th cha 59th chapter, excuse me. We're familiar mostly with Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot say, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your sins have separated between you and your God. 
We're familiar with that. Jump on down, if you will, to Isaiah 59 and verse 7 and 8. He says, Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. When I was doing some studying, I believe his brother David Roper in his commentary pointed this out. He talks about the throat, the tongues, the lips, the mouth, and the feet. Sin, dear friends, is a fatal illness from head to toe and everything in between, is it not? Sin is destructive. And you and I knew that. And Paul illustrates it very plainly here in these Old Testament passages. So that kind of answers uh, questions 8 and 9 as well as this in verse 18 where he says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. And there he's quoting, making a reference to the 36th Psalm in the first verse. So we see he's quoted from Psalm 14, Psalm 5, Psalm 140, Psalm 10, Psalm 36, and Isaiah 59 verses 7 and 8. By the way, I do feel it is important here to just briefly mention from verses 9 through 18 what Paul doesn't teach. Paul does not teach the false doctrine of total or of a total hereditary depravity, one of the five tenets of Calvinism. The idea that everyone born after Adam inherits Adam's sin. You are depraved from the moment you were born. That's not what he teaches. Here clearly Paul is teaching that those with sin are doomed unless you remove sin. But you weren't born with all this wickedness. You developed it on your own when you turned away from God. Now look here in verse 19, if you will. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty before God. I like to think of this as the last mouth that was going to be closed was that of the Jews because they had such a long time to repent and turn back to what God has said. But they didn't. They didn't. They rejected him time and time again. So Paul is saying, whatever the law says, it says to those who are now under the law, every mouth will be stopped. The whole world's guilty of sin, dear friends. The whole world. Mankind as a whole, it is. But we can have our sins forgiven, and that's what Paul's going to talk about in the sixth chapter. But I don't want to get too far ahead. So with that, look at verse 20. Therefore... And every time you see the word therefore in Scripture, I want you to say to yourselves in your head, what is this therefore? Because Paul, or whoever writing it, but Paul in our passage is summing up what he's just said. And it's one of those things where if you may have missed a point or two, here's the sum, here's the closing. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We see divine law produces a knowledge of sin. It exposes all as sinners. You know Romans 3.23, right? For all have sinned, come show the glory of God. That's what Bill gets to speak on next week. It's hard for me just to stop at verse 20, but I tell you what, summing it up here, Paul has shown that, you know what? Every objection that someone has when it comes to Scripture can be answered with Scripture. Notice Paul didn't say, well, it might be this. It could be that. Paul says it is written. He doesn't give book, chapter, verse like we think of it today. But the Bible student in the first world, they could go back and look through their book of Psalms, look through their scroll of Isaiah, and they could have found these passages. They would have known these passages. So let's see. The rest of our 10, 11, 12 are fill in the blank. Chapter of question 13, was anyone justified before God? No. And then finally, we look at the law. By the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the start of uh, illustrating that sin is a worldwide dilemma. But as a bonus for you, three application lessons to close this out. Number one, dear friends, when God makes a covenant, He intends to keep that covenant. And the entirety of the Bible from beginning to end is filled with God keeping His covenants. 
And for those of us that are Christians, when we were baptized into Christ, we made a covenant with God that we're going to live different from the world, that we're not going to look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, think like the world, behave like the world. Are you keeping that covenant? Lesson number two. All the commandments of God are righteous, and He is the righteous judge. We see that from Psalm 119 and verse 60. That's the sum of thy commandments. And dear friends, I'll tell you now, I thank the good Lord every day that He is the judge and not me, because I don't want to be the one on that great day that has to meet all this out. I'm happy with just trying to make sure I'm living faithful and trying to help you live faithful as well. Number three, we should not do evil just so God's grace can be abundant. He'll talk about that in the sixth chapter. Instead, we should live a life that is in accordance with God's Word. You don't go out and sin just because you can get forgiven, but if you sin, you can be forgiven. So we come with a close, with an invitation, if you will. Are you a Christian? Paul's writing to Christians. He's illustrating the benefits of those who are Christians. But if you're not a Christian tonight, Jesus' invitation still extends to you. If you're not a Christian, you become one by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized. Go down that watery grave, come up a new creature alive in Christ. If you are a Christian, remain faithful to the very end. And then that's when you receive that crown of life, not a moment before. If we can help you in any way at all tonight, whatever your need may be, please let it be known while we stand and while we sing.